Hello friends, family, faculty, mentors, fellow artists and collectors. My name is Nastasha Heim and I'll graduate in May with a Bachelor of Fine Arts with a concentration in sculpture and ceramics. I was homeschooled from third grade through my high school graduation and I earned my Associates of Science in Human Services before starting on this path. I can't draw. I'm not artistic. I'm not creative. I can barely draw a stick figure. These are things I was still saying well into my early 20s, and I'm not entirely sure where they came from. I learned photography from my mother, and though writing more than a sentence or two was exhausting to me in grade school, something clicked for me around age 11, and I haven't stopped writing since. I love to write and take photos, and I probably always will. I didn't have anyone in my life who was particularly critical of my creative endeavors. Honestly, I was a perfectionist, and it was probably an early coping mechanism associated with ADHD because I have to double and triple check things I write by hand for typos and errors. But as I grew to adulthood, perfectionism stopped being a tool to keep my work clear and correct and became a massive hurdle for me. In my early 20s, I took my bare, very bare bones sewing skills and determined I would teach myself to sew. Through sewing, I learned that mistakes are okay. And if there's an error, you can tear out the seam, go back, and do it again until it's right. I learned how to learn from my mistakes rather than be discouraged by them. After earning my associates, I burned out emotionally from a number of stressors that had nothing to do with school. Knowing the burnout rate of people in social work and psychology, I realized I was going to start, I realized if I was going to school to start my career, this might not be the path for me in the long term. Around that time, I fell headfirst into the world of superhero comics and became a super nerd. Not only was I collecting and reading and analyzing comics with my friends online, I was very active on Tumblr, creating photo sets out of comic panels and artwork. I sank untold hours into creating these. And as I was not terribly accomplished with Photoshop and digital effects, most of my work was just cropping images and arranging them to fit the size limitations of the format, sometimes slightly tweaking the colors on the images to make them visually pleasing, but also to draw attention to or away from certain panels. As a writer, first and foremost, I, very, I realized very quickly that depending on how I arranged these snippets of comic pages, what I emphasized, how I drew the eye across my arrangement, I could completely alter the narrative of what I was making. And eventually I was creating narratives and connecting multiple stories out of the source works. Uh, so this is one of my photo sets that I made. And not a whole lot done to it, but moving images around. This is one I created out of multiple comics. Uh, the guy doing push-ups and the guy in the third panel down here <clears throat> on the right are the same person. So I will give you a moment to read if you so desire. And here's the rest of that set. I started to think maybe I have more creativity than I think. Maybe drawing just isn't my thing because I don't know how to do it and I would benefit from formal teaching. I enrolled at Pensacola State College with the intent to eventually become a comic artist, the perfect marriage of visual art and literature. When I transferred to Augusta University a year and a half later, it was in the drawing and painting concentration because I wanted to draw and paint, right? These are some of my earlier drawings. On the right uh, was one of the first things that I made for uh, my 2D class back in Pensacola State. The others were, as you can see, much later. And don't get me wrong, I love to paint and I've come to enjoy drawing. I love watercolor, I love oil, though I could probably spend my time just mixing colors and I'd be just as happy, if not more so, than I am actually painting. And I'm not gonna impugn on my 2D skills here. I did really well in all my painting classes and I made work that I'm really proud of. In my first semester at AU, I took 3D design, and though I didn't make anything terribly noteworthy in that class, and I found the vast range of available sculpture, sculpture materials a little overwhelming, 
I recognized that building something three-dimensional was immensely interesting to me. My mom might have taught me photography and crafting with paint, yarn, sketching nature, making candles in holes in the sand, so many things as part of my homeschooling. But my dad taught me about how things work, how to approach and execute car maintenance, how to build things, how to plan projects with graph paper, measure twice, cut once, all of that how to make things that were sturdy with an eye to design. My 3D design professor, Brian Rust, was very, very expertly talked up his wood carving class in the upcoming term, and I enrolled in it as soon as I was able. I had no idea how I would deal with working subtractively because in my life thus far, the eraser had been my best friend. So I enrolled in carving one, and suddenly I was looking at things three-dimensionally, thinking about how light helps create shape and form, and I was taking material away that could in no way be put back. There is no undo button on a piece of wood or plaster. I found the process absolutely fascinating, something I could sink my whole brain into and just work from one side to the next, from one part to the next, then go back and work that part further, around and around and around. Though I enjoyed and even found myself successful with a number of different medium, media, I had never worked on a piece of art and found it so naturally intuitive for me, making decisions on the go and really sinking myself into making without a structured plan of approach, and at times without a clear vision of what I wanted to end up with at the end. Wood has so much pattern and shape to it to begin with that carving it is a bit like exploring seeing what is under this layer, where that grain pattern is going to lead, and what can I do to get this plane talking to this other one in a dynamic way. My first wood piece, Teshuva, was a revelation for me. I was once a perfectionist and I leaned heavily on planning, on organization, and I found, technically speaking, I was pretty good at emulating something I had seen and recreating it because my attention to detail was ridiculous. Making something realistic, I could still fall back on some aspects of my perfectionism and refine and refine and refine, but so often it was at the cost of any life in the piece. And I didn't enjoy it. It didn't spark my passion, and you could see that in the work. But I struggled with the unknown, because my imagination is very vivid, but my imagination just doesn't work that way. I can imagine something someone explains to me, but my ideas tend to be more general and sketched in. For this piece, I wanted to do something like a city block, gridded out with a lot of geometric features reminiscent of buildings. As I worked with the actual tools on the material, things would jump out at me about what would look interesting and what I needed to do to create something with interesting smaller parts, but one where those parts work together to form a greater whole. I had created this grid with deep chainsaw grooves that didn't quite split the block apart. So then I was sort of tied to those. And a lot of my challenge was how to get down into those spaces so they didn't remain unworked and flat. As I worked, curves and protrusions came forward and I carved according to what looked interesting alone and in relation to everything around it. What sort of silhouette did it create? How does the light fall across it? I ended up with this rather organic piece that evokes bones, canyon landscapes, vertebrae, insect shells, uh, all sorts of things. Much of my visual interest is drawn to these organic forms and how they're repeated throughout nature in stone, in wood, in plant life, in animal life, even in the way our weather develops. There's something deeply engaging to me about these shared forms and how they often emerge from one aspect of nature being shaped by another. Sand on the beach rippled by waves and wind. Canyon rocks undulating and stratified from wind and water and how we relate to these natural materials according to their nature. I never thought I would enjoy drawing bones or drapery because they can be kind of fussy but their natural structures of strength predating human architecture and the natural effects of gravity on a fabric material of a certain weight. There's a scientific surety here 
and it's reflected all over the world in natural and man-made things because everything is made up of the same basic materials and reacts to our physical environment and laws in certain ways. I received a lot of feedback about my first wood piece being reminiscent of bones, and as I had an adjacent block cut from the same log, I felt they should relate to each other in some way. These are far more representational, but after cutting them into the general anatomical shape, I gave myself space to abstract the features and proportions however I wanted. Though I was meditating on my personal thoughts and experiences in my own body as I worked on them, I was also thinking deeply on the material itself. Wood as the bones of trees. Wood as the bones of structures, of tools, of furniture, as burnable fuel for survival. With worn, I focused on the pelvis and hip joint as one of the joints that sees the most wear and tear for many of us throughout our lives. The pelvis as the cradle of life for those who bear children and the first cradle we all slept in. My mother often spoke of how she never thought about death so much as when she was pregnant. And I found with my own pregnancies, this held true for me as well. It wasn't so much a fear of death as a heightened awareness of it, because the birth at that point, under whatever form it takes, is entirely certain and inescapable. For this piece, I experimented with sandblasting the surface of the wood, which gave it this heavily weathered and aged surface that added to that sense of decay and mortality, and also longevity, that it's also withstanding the test of time as best it can. As I began this last piece, I had really started to hone in on my interest in erosion and how natural forces of weather interact and shape one another. Water, sand, wind, heat, and tides, and floods, and fires, and natural disasters, constantly shaping and reshaping even the hardest of materials when enough time or violence is applied. This piece is made of hackberry, and the black lines you see are called spalting caused by water entering the trunk because of the way the branches form on the tree. I thought a lot about the meandering crawl of rivers and caves I visited formed by ancient subterranean rivers. This is a wander map, I want to say, of the Mississippi River before the Army Corps of Engineers uh, blocked in the Mississippi. And there's a incredibly interesting article called Louisiana Loses Its Boot by Brett Anderson talking about why we need rivers to move this way. Um, but I won't digress further. Check it out. The piece had a large check, uh, like a crack in it when I began, which only grew as I opened up the core of the block with multiple converging tunnels that weave through the piece. At the end, when I had it in the sandblasting cabinet, I could see more checks beginning before my eyes as the wood was forcibly dried at an incredible rate while being abraded by sand at high velocity. While I felt this only added to the eroded effect I was going for, I had to be careful as the piece grew more and more fragile by the moment. One of my first class classes here at AU was also the most transformative for me. Taking aesthetics with Dr. Michael Schwartz put words and a structure to so many things I'd grown to understand as I moved through my adult life. Much of that class is devoted to learning about integral theory, which is a framework for analyzing most anything and conceptualizes growth and development through adulthood and to the end of our lives. Obviously, I am no expert and I don't have the time here to go into depth on any of this. But one of the aspects of this theory that spoke to me the most was the idea of evolution and these stages of consciousness. This is not a linear path of growth. We can exist in a number of these stages simultaneously in different areas of our lives and move up as well as down as we change and go grow throughout our lives. And the key to leveling up, so to speak, is not achieved by stopping lower level behaviors or obliterating our shortcomings, but by incorporating them more fully into ourselves. 
I believe that our flaws are also often our greatest strengths. Being a perfectionist was the reason I felt I could not make art, and it crippled me creatively. But through self-acceptance and incorporation of this behavior into my art making, it has become a large part of how I make work and what makes my work unique. By embracing this aspect of myself, I have found it no longer rules me. I can move forward knowing I can draw, I am creative and artistic, and it's all right if stick figures just aren't my specialty. Thank you so much for your time, and please see my work and the exceptional work of my co-exhibitors in our online show hosted by the Mary S. Bird Gallery on their Instagram page. Thank you.